All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. That was more enthusiastic than I thought. I thought everybody but me went out to drink last night. <laughs> All right, and welcome to my keynote, Ruby versus the Titans of FP. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself so that you know where I'm coming from with this, because it's going to be more of a story. So I've been a hobbyist programmer for about a decade. The very first thing that I ever programmed, I was 12 years old. Who here remembers QBasic on like MS-DOS? Who here remembers Gorillas? My very first line of code was to cheat in that game. <laughs> I made my brother always play player two, and I made his win values display something other than what they are, just a little bit to the left or right, so that he can never hit me. And that began a lifelong love of programming. I'm also fascinated with functional programming. It's a very mathematical discipline, and it's, it's very easy for me to reason about what I'm doing. However, I'm relatively new to industry. I'm at my first job at Mavenlink, a little company you've probably heard of from the three other speakers that have been wandering around here. And I've, I've been there for eight months, and it's my first real experience with Ruby. And so while I've, ex I've experienced Haskell and Clojure and JavaScript, it's only really this year that I got into Ruby. Yet somehow I snuck onto the stage of RubyConf as a keynote speaker. I'm still trying to figure that one out. All right. So when I first started learning Ruby, my motivation was like, oh, hey, like, I need to do this for my job. But I also wanted to drag all my functional knowledge with me. And not many people use Ruby in a functional matter. If you want to create something, you, you have an object for it, and it has methods, and everything's OO, and it was just like, OK, I'll roll with it until a few months ago when somebody poked me to do a CFP, and I finally decided to actually explore it. And I was like, OK, I'm going to make functional programming work in Ruby. And this talk is a documentation of my past three months distilled so that you don't have to see me yelling at a REPL trying to figure out what's broken. <laughs> All right, so welcome to Ruby versus the Titans of FP. Before we get started, we want to talk about what functional programming is, because not everybody is familiar with it. Now, if you ask 20 people, they'll give you 20 different definitions. Some will people for math. Some will people, some people will bring out their Bible of category theory and sit you down for a three-hour lecture. I like to be a little bit more pragmatic. So to me, I like to describe it as this. It's a programming paradigm that focuses on functions as transformations over generic objects and data structures as opposed to objects that we model. A good example of this is a login object. Now, if somebody, I think everybody here has written a login object if they've worked on some web app. And usually when you approach it, you're like, okay, I'm gonna give it some attributes and it's gonna know its internal state, but then it's also gonna know how to validate itself. It's also going to know how to delete itself. It's also going to know how to save itself to the database. Functional programming separates those two things. So you can still have a login object, which can end up being a generic data structure, just like, OK, I know the user I'm associated with. I know if I've been deleted at. But then you'll have a separate set of functions that can operate on that object, for example, to invalidate it. So why is that a good thing? Well. One, it's easier to reuse logic, and I think this is one of the biggest benefits for it. I'm pretty sure everybody's ran into the situation where they're like, oh, hey, this class has an amazing method that I really want to grab, and, but I can't subclass it for whatever reason, because inheritance just scares me sometimes. And so it's really nice to have that already separated so that you can then figure out how to make it generic for an entire class of objects. It lets you compose smaller units of logic together, which will be an entire 10 minutes in this presentation. And it can, keyword can, in giant air quotes, result in cleaner and more performant code, if it's done the right way. If it's done the wrong way, it can get kind of scary. So these are my five key features of a functional programming language. And this is probably contentious. If you go to like the functional programming lexicon, there's like 300 definitions inside of it. But these are the five things that are important to me. Higher order functions, carrying composition, functional purity, and immutability. We are only going to talk about three of those today. Functional purity and immutability are things that we can do. 
through the data structures that we use, and through how we treat the flow of our program. However, higher order functions, composition, and currying tend to be things that are more primitive in our languages, and if we don't have support for them, we end up losing a lot of things. So today I'm gonna to compare Ruby versus Clojure, Haskell, and JavaScript in order to see if we have those things that make other functional programming languages nice. And we're gonna start with a little thing called Clojure. Now Clojure was born in 2007, and it is of the Lisp family, and that makes some people very happy, and that makes some people very sad. So what makes it a functional language? It has higher order functions, it has first class functions, which just means that we can take a function and stuff it into a variable and then use it anywhere we want. And then its standard library has immutable data structures and this makes me so happy. And I wish I had more chances to use it. This is an example of what a function call enclosure looks like. It's just a list. The first thing in the list is a function. Everything else is arguments. Uh, Lisp is actually short for Lisp processing. And this seems elegant and simple and nice, but then you end up with programs that look like this. This is a lazy take, and those parens at the very bottom of the slide either make you make a face like that cat, <laughs> or you put on a robe and you become one of the old wizards of Lisp. <laughs> All right. But we're not going to dive into anything crazy with Clojure. We're going to talk specifically about map. Going back to our definition, Map is a function that takes arguments. What are those arguments? Well, the very first thing is a function that we want to transform some collection. The example that we're going to use and that you're going to be sick of at the end of 35 minutes is going to be increment. We're going to increment and decrement so many numbers, it's going to be great. And then the second thing that we pass in is a collection, which is going to be a standard array for our purpose. Um, and so this is what it ends up looking like. We, we map our increment function over one through five. It returns two through six. And we've already arrived at the first capability, which is higher order functions. A higher order function is a function that either takes in other functions as part of its arguments or returns a function as its result. The example being our map taking in a function for its transformer. Can we use this in Ruby? Obviously. I'm pretty sure everybody's just like, why? Everybody knows we can do this. So the standard way of doing a map in Ruby is to have some collection, call map on it as method, and then pass in arguments. We're going to create something a little bit more generic for reasons that will slowly become clear as we walk through this. So we're going to start with an up rock and give it our two arguments. Function as our first argument, which makes this map a higher order function, and then our collection. And then we're going to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to use, we're just gonna call the collections map method uh, if it quacks like a duck. It must work for us. And then this is, if you've ever read the closure documentation, F and Col are used all over the place, and this is what they actually stand for, function collection. Congratulations, you can now read 90% of the closure documentation because that's all it is. It's, it's, all, it's all signatures. All right, so how do we use this? Well, here we're gonna create an increment that just takes in a number and returns one to us. We are going to give ourselves a list of numbers, two through four, and then we are going to use map.call in order to invoke it with our arguments. This drives me insane. Fortunately, Ruby is nice to us, and we can hide it. This was a mind blow like two months ago when I was like learning, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna get tired of using call anywhere. Oh, there's syntactic sugar for it, which is good. Um, and this is at the interpreter level, so if you define an object that has a call method on it, it has this alias on it as well. And so you can hide all your calls, it looks kind of beautiful, the dots still throw me off because I want them to look like method calls, but it works out. A more complex example, going back to the logins that I keep talking about, is like, oh hey, we're gonna create an anonymous proc that, well, not really anonymous, we're stuffing it into something. 
We're going to create a proc that takes a login and sets the deleted at the time now. And we're going to say, OK, is deleted at not nil? Cool, we deleted something. And then we're going to create a list of logins, or a set of logins, or a vector of logins. So I have not found a use for vector in actual production code yet. And we're going to map over that with our invalidate login helper. And so we've met our first requirement here, that we can use higher order functions. And the syntax is a little bit different than what I'm used to, but it's there. And so the next thing we're going to cover is currying, and we're going to turn to our old friend slash enemy, Haskell. Haskell is from, was created in 1990, so it is one year younger than me, and I officially feel old now. And it's from a family of languages called ML, which is short for meta language, which I always thought was machine language until like two days ago, and somebody corrected me on this. And the things that make it a functional language is that everything is curried inside of it. Everything is pure, and it has the most beautiful type system that I have ever seen in the language. Although it also drives some people insane. So what does a function call look like in Haskell? Well, here we're going to create our increment function by calling add, which is just going to be a plus sign here, with one. And then we're going to take that increment and then pass it into map with two, three, four, and we get three, four, five, as we expect. But what was with that ink? Add takes two numbers and we only gave it one and it didn't blow up and give us our argument error. This is strange. Let's investigate. In the worst possible way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're gonna talk, a little, we're gonna diverge a little bit and talk about Hindley Milner type systems, um, which might be a little bit heavy handed, but will help us figure out what's going on here. So we can be here talking about them forever. But two things that we need to know are, are there. Is that it can be used to express the signature of a function and that Haskell uses it to annotate types and it will check against the types that you annotate. An example, add, or at least add as we're used to. We have a function name here and then we take two arguments here and we just group them in parens to say that we're taking them at the same time. We have a function arrow which tells us we're going from something to something and it gives us a result. Congratulations, you all can now read type signatures in Haskell, for the most part. <laughs> all right, so this is how we're used to doing it. We call add with two numbers, it gives us one number, it yells at us if we give it, um, it yells at us if we give it one number, and blows up, and we get all sorts of weird things, and then we get a 30 mile long stack trace, and it's never fun. Haskell does things a different way. So Haskell still has an add function, and it still has the same behavior where it takes in two numbers and it gives us back a number, but we can only give it one argument at a time. And when we give it an argument, it will return to us a function waiting for the rest of its arguments. And so let's go back to our ink and figure out what happened. So we have add here and we give it one and so we pass one in here, and you can guess what we got back. A function waiting for the second number. And this gets us to our definition for a curried function. And this is why you do not rewrite slides at 10 o'clock at night before you present. This slide right here. I rewrote this three, four times, hated the definition, and I just said, okay, it's midnight. I'm not gonna mess with this anymore. So a curried function is a function that upon being applied to less than the total set of arguments that it's supposed to take, returns another function waiting for the rest of its arguments. So our add function takes two things. We give it one, it returns a function waiting for one. If we had a reduce that took three things and we gave it two things, it would return as a function waiting for the last thing. So on and so forth, if we had 10 and we gave it five, it, gave, it would wait for five more and just give us a function waiting for that. And it lets us do some borderline dangerous things. So we're gonna implement this in Ruby. And we're going to use our best friend closures in order to do it. So here we're gonna create an add and we're gonna have a proc that takes in X. And when we call this with a number, it's gonna to return to us a proc that waits for Y. When we call this, then it will give us results. 
So we're going to go create our friendly increment function by just saying add 1. And it's going to bind that 1 to x. And we're going to get a function that waits for y, and we'll just add 1 to whatever y is. So we can call immediately, and we get ink 2, and we expect 3. Or we can map it, and we get our incremented array, as we've gotten the entire time, I hope. Oh, this is the easy slack. So there is a better way. Nobody wants to write 20 nested closures. Luckily, we have native currying. This made me jealous, because I came from JavaScript, and we don't have native currying in JavaScript. So when I saw this, I was really happy, because then we can end up writing our functions like we normally do. X, Y, Z, do a thing, have it automatically curry and handle for us. And in addition to doing all the things that we can do with currying, we can also just call it at any time with all of its arguments. And then we just get the result back immediately. So a quick divergence in the order of arguments. You'll notice that Haskell, Clojure, and our Ruby map all had the same order of arguments. And this is why. If we wanted to create a function called ink map that, that iterates over a list of numbers and increments all of them, we can build it this way assuming that our add and map are curried. What if we wanted to decrement everything instead? Well, that's easy enough to do. We use our add and just give it negative one instead of one and build up the function the exact same way. And through currying, we can build entire families of functions off of primitives. I I could write a mathematical proof right now, but it would not be good. I can create every step function from my add. I can create all, every iterative transform function from my map. And that makes it easier for us, because then we don't have to worry about those things. Then we get to abstract the layer away. So we've got higher order functions, and we've got currying. What's left? Our best friend. JavaScript. So JavaScript is relatively new in 1995. And it doesn't really get to be put in a family. It's kind of like scheme with C syntax. And so it's not really like anything else. And so we get to name it its own thing. What makes it a functional language? Well, first class functions, which we have determined lets us do higher order functions, and closures which let us do currying. But past that, it doesn't really have much. It has really strong functional programming libraries, but not many things built into the language. And so despite the fact that we have all of these really low-level tools in JavaScript, the core API doesn't really like us doing things in an FP style in some places. Example, array. So we created an array three numbers, map is a method on array. And so if we want to access map, that's how we have to get it. Pop gets, a little, gets something off of the end of the array and gives it back to us, and it mutates the array underneath, which destroys immutability and doesn't really work out for us in a functional flow. Wait a second. Doesn't Ruby do these same things? Hmm. Hmm. It does exactly the same things, actually. Map is also a method, and pop also mutates. And so a lot of the stuff in the standard library that would create friction for a functional programming flow exists in both languages. So that gives us a clue, because we can look at how functional programmers in JavaScript solve their problems in order to figure out how in Ruby I can solve my problems. And the answer is functional programming libraries. In the beginning, there was underscore, and it was OK, kind of. But it got the order of arguments wrong. And so Lodash came around. But unless you use Lodash FP, nothing was curried. So Ramda came by, and everything's curried, and everything's in the right order of arguments, and everything has the Haskell names for its functions, and it lets you pretend that you're not in a browser. And so it ends up being my favorite thing. Out of all the things in Ramda, my favorite thing is Compose, because this lets me glue things together. 
How many people have ever done this? You, you write a method, it takes in a thing, you invoke it, and you save off the result to something. And then you take that result and you immediately pass it into another function. And then you save off that result. And then you go pass, save, pass, save, pass, save, pass, save, until 30 years later, you're finally able to return the thing from all of these functions that you've been running. There is a better way. In this case, Ramda gives us a nice compose. Ramda also gives us all these nice courage functions. And so I'm going to define add two here as, oh, hey, I'm going to create an incrementer with add one, glue those two functions together, and then the argument that I pass in gets passed into one of the incrementers. The output of that gets passed into the next incrementer. And so we create a chain or a pipe of functions here. And so our add to two returns four. This is a little bit more complex. And if, you, if the type signatures make you feel weird, ignore them. They're not there. They're, they're slightly grayed out for a reason. Here we're going to create something a bit more complex, map reduces. So if you wanted to do a map reduce, usually you have some function that takes in something, calls this map, saves off the result, calls reduce, and then passes that back. Here, map and reduce are curried because they're in Ram's standard library. Map takes in an incrementer, well, a transformer and a collection. We give it a transformer. It gives us a function that waits for a collection. Reduce takes in a reducer, an initial value, and a collection, and it returns a final value. And because the types match up for all of that stuff, we get to just glue them together like this. This also lets us be point free so that we never have to mention our data. And if we never mention our data, I can't mistype it, which is why I love it. So benefits. We get actual easy logic reuse. If we create an increment function and a decrement function, we can glue them exactly two ways together. But if we had 20 things, then we could put those together like Legos any way that we want. And so we get actual reuse of logic, and we can do very strange things with it. We can also compose our compositions, and this makes for really easy refactors. A really good example is a response re um, request response cycle. I have a composition that takes a request into some internal state. I have a composition that does something with their internal state. And then I have a composition that takes the internal state and maps it to the response object. I can isolate those three separate things and then compose them together and make my entire request response cycle into a single function, which ends up being really clean when you have 300 routes. So how are we going to do this in Ruby, like all things? Here we're going to create a binary compose that just worries about two functions. We're going to create an outer proc that takes in two functions, and it's going to return a proc that waits for the arguments. Once we get the arguments, we're just going to call y with the arguments, and the output of that is immediately going to be passed into x. The reason that this goes y to x instead of x to y is because it works like mathematical composition. There is a, there's usually a pipe function that does the opposite order in most functional libraries. And so we're going to create our inc here, and we're going to compose it just like we did in the JavaScript example. And we, if we add two to four, we get six back in the same world. If we want to do this to more than two functions, then we can take the compose that we just ma made and create a very added compose. And here we're just going to say, oh, hey, we're going to take in all of our functions. And then we are going to reduce over that with our binary compose operator. And that will do the exact same thing, only with as many functions as you like. So here we can create an add three from three increments. Why we wouldn't just use add three to create our add three? I don't know. It works out for this. And then if we add three to four, we get seven back. Nobody wants to write this. 
This is one of those snippets of code that you'll find yourself using everywhere once you're used to it. And so the next question is, what if I just want a gem? I wrote it. And so, if you go to uh, RubyGems and you look up Reductio, it only has three functions, add, compose, and map, because those are the three functions I need for this demonstration. And it works. The, the add is curried, as you can see, and the compose is variadic, so you can use it to glue 20 functions together. Is that a good idea? Never. Can you do it? Yes, I have. It's not pretty. Don't, don't ever look at my GitHub. It's a scary place. All right. And so this is, is something that I'm very happy about, because I got comfortable enough in Ruby to create a functional library. And so what have we established Ruby can do? Well, we set out to find higher order functions, composition, and currying, comparing it to three different languages, and we found all those things. We haven't looked at functional purity, we haven't looked at immutability, but the tools that we have are enough. And so, while people like to pit Ruby against other functional programming languages, nothing stops it from being part of the circle too. And that's what I've got for you today. Oh, I went through that way faster than I expected, which means I have question time. Um, so this is gonna be interesting. So, next steps. If you wanna learn more about functional programming, Dr. Frisbee's Mostly Adequate Guide to Functional Programming is a book on GitHub. It is written by a cute badger. That is actually Brian Laundorf, who is a functional programming guru at Netflix. All the examples are in JavaScript, but it should be easy enough. We also have my repo for Reductio, which is also a gem now. I wanna get more discussion going because I feel like I've trapped myself in this bubble trying to divine things the hard way in order to try and learn things, but now I wanna talk with people about it. So if you're on Twitter, tweet questions at me or just ask me them in the next 10 minutes and then tweet with the hashtag functional Ruby and I'll be looking at it and I hope other people will be looking at it so we can, we can start a discussion. And then please help me. I have never written an open source gem before and Yard is confusing. So <laughs> Tara, Tara has convinced me that I need documentation. So if you're a functional programmer and you would like to help with that, or if you're not a functional programmer and you want to learn, please, please come help me with this. Um, and before I'm done, that's my contact information on the left. I want to give a shout out to um, Transcord. First, I want to give a shout out to RubyConf because it has been a hard week for me as a trans woman of color and I have felt very welcome here. And I am very glad. It's my first RubyConf too, so I'm happy that I made it out here. But if you know any trans people or allies that are looking for a sense of community, the link up top is a link to Transcord, which is a global support group that I would love to have more members. And if people have not already sold you on the Kool-Aid that is maybe link yet, then we have this nice engineering blog link here that covers our, a bit of our culture. And so I think we are good for questions. I was not prepared for this. <laughs> yes. Okay, so the question was that um, they have trouble seeing the benefits of point freestyle and it's, it's, it kind of seems obtuse and not indirect because you never mention your data, so you're never sure where your data really is. And so one of the things that really appeals to me uh, about point freestyle is that we get to walk away from the constraints of our data. With the MapReduce that I demonstrated earlier, it doesn't matter if it's an array or if it's a linked list, or if it's a maybe, or either, or an IO, or some other, some other functor, 
I don't worry about that. I just know that there is an interface that anything coming into this function has to deal with. And then that lets me use it generically. And so that ends up being that ends up being part of the benefits for me because I can just say in my type annotations like, oh, this takes in a monad and it returns blah. And then I don't really have to worry about my data past that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like duct typing. So in, in, in JavaScript, it's actually treated that way. So if you use Ramda and you pass in something that has a map method on it as the mappable to map, it will use that method on it. And so you get something akin to that. Okay, so the question was, and please correct me if I just completely fudge this, is that eventually you have I.O. Eventually there has to be some side effect. All programs have side effect. Otherwise, what are they really doing, right? And so how do you handle that in functional programming? How do you deal with that when you have basically two styles where you have an object defined in the OO style that has to do these things, but you also want to create this logic in a functional style? and if you went to the composition talk, James actually had a really good thing about this. Um, so go back and watch his talk, but I'm gonna try and crush this. Well, my first instinct is to just tell you use an IO monad, but that doesn't exist in Ruby yet. I'm working on it. <laughs> so that's, that's one of the things where right now in our company, I'm on a team that's using React. And so the way that I handle it is that when I do compositions, I push that to the very end of our chains. And so you can, because composes, because compositions are functions themselves and you can compose them with other things, I can create a pure composition that goes from point A to B. And then in my actual app, just compose that with something that takes in data and causes a side effect. And so you get, a, you can, you get to create a very clear divide there and say like, oh, hey, this is my pure code. Inside of this library, everything is beautiful. And then the side effects get pushed to the edge of your app. And that's how I tend to handle that. <gasps> I have strong opinions about active record scopes. <laughs> OK. So, so I, I wasn't able to hear the second part, after scopes. OK. Um, the question was, how do I feel about active record scopes ignoring the rest of the library? Um, I like that scopes are just kind of composing on each other in order to build a, a SQL query. I don't like that at any point somebody can cause a side effect by doing something that actually loads from database. Database calls are one of those things where it's like, oh, hey, I knew I loaded up a user and I automatically went to the database. And I'm like, eh? Can I separate that stuff somehow? And so when I write scopes, I try to write them to say where I would write compositions, where I try and push anything that would possibly load as far down the chain as possible, instead of being like, oh, hey, like, I need to load the association for this thing, and then a database hit occurs because of that. Does that answer your question? Cool. I feel like I'm back in class. <laughs> okay. I should be standing behind the podium, right? Anybody else? Oops, yes. I haven't. I have not. OK, so the question was, have I done benchmarking? Because they have heard that currying might propose, might, blah, what are words? Words are hard. Uh, it might impose a performance penalty. And so I have not done that benchmarking. I want to do that benchmarking when I, I start fleshing out Reductio, just so that we can say, oh, hey, like, this is a performance penalty. You can do three less operations a second, but it gets you such beauty. And so that is, that is a thing that I also want to work on. I have not heard of it, but I have also only been a Rubyist for eight months, so my opinion might not be always qualified. All right, does that answer your question? OK, that's good. So let's see if I can go back to the, huh? So the question was, why do we not want to compose 20 things together. Why do we want to keep our compositions short? Well, and this is 
uh, this is actually a really good demonstrator. So looking at the type signature for this, this is already kind of complex. This is doing a lot of things. It's iterating over a list, it's applying a function to everything to that list, we get a new copy of the list back with all of those things transformed, and then we start folding over that list in order to get a final value. This encompasses a lot. And if we were to start adding new things on there, like we want to map and do X thing, we want to map and do Y thing, we want to map and do Z thing, then it's really easy to just look at a page of a composition and be like, what does this even do? I do this all the time. And that ends up being a problem because I'll go back to old code, for example, something I did for Hackathon, I was like, oh, hey, I can bang this out in five minutes because it's just one giant composition. But then when I go back and look at it later, it's like, what was I doing? It helps that there is a vocabulary when you use a, st a standard functional library. So you'd be like, OK, this thing is head, so it grabbed the first thing off of this array, and then this incremented it, and then this appended it to something else. But it, it, still, it still gets to be difficult once you get past a certain length. And because compositions can be themselves be made of compositions, it's very easy to say, OK, I have 20 things here. Let me grab these five put them in their own composition, and then replace those five with one line referencing that composition. So it also gives you easy refactoring, which ends up being a beautiful thing. Because then you can have your short like three, five line things, but then still encapsulate all of your functionality into one single function that gets passed and has a callback to something. Does that answer your question? Cool. OK, I've got four minutes left. Uh, anybody else? No? Oh, last call. Cool. Thank you.